It's, uh, it's great to be back. Uh, we certainly took advantage of the Dean's offer for uh, helping us with tickets to the, uh, the SC game. I grew up in Southern California, so I had a lot of friends that went to SC, but obviously would much prefer to uh, be affiliated with this school and this, uh, this university. It's a little bit of a, a dangerous uh, title of the series, right, A View from the Top, because it sort of insinuates the only place to go is down. So when I started to think about my presentation today, it made me quite nervous to think, well, what do I do for an encore in a couple of years if this is a view from the top? So I'd like to rename it a, a view from the middle. I'm 48 years old, and I certainly don't view myself or our company on the top of, of much. And I think that's a, it's an important point. Um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break my presentation into three parts. Uh, I think uh, Randy and the dean were a little bit nervous that I was going to talk too much about the company. But I'll try to mix in some personal experiences and talk to you about a, a case study. Uh, it's an old company. It's a very interesting company. I'm going to walk you through when I joined the company six years ago, what it looked like and what we've done over the last six years to make it a little bit more progressive. We'll talk to you about stock price and how you create value for your shareholders. And then, of course, at the end, I'll share with you some personal background and, and some thoughts I had on leadership that might be useful to you as you think about your careers. and and uh, and leave the university and decide what you want to go uh, and do with your lives. Um, I'll try to keep my comments to 30 minutes, and then I'll leave it uh, wide open for your questions, of course. As the dean pointed out, we're the third oldest uh, manufacturing, so non-insurance, non-banking company in the Fortune 500. 1833, founded in Mount Vernon, Ohio. We basically started with steam engines, and we were the first company that automated tractors for using a steam engine, and that's that top right-hand picture. They used to use horses to steer them because they didn't have a steering mechanism. Um, and then the company merged with Bessemer Engine Company in 1929. Bessemer Engine Company was known for steam engines for the oil and gas industry. And our ticker symbol today is CBE, Cooper Bessemer Engine Company. And so we can date our history back all the way till 1929. We're almost $6 billion this year, well, $5.8 billion, 31,000 employees and 34% of our revenue is international, which we'll talk about later. Um, I thought it would be helpful to go back 25 years. So just, uh, I graduated Berkeley in 1982 time frame. So uh, Cooper was about $3 billion. And there was a, a CEO by the name of Bob Sizik from 75 to 95, so a 20-year tenure. And he was responsible for that accelerated growth, mostly through acquisition. We got into oil and gas, we got into automotive, we got into a whole dump, a bunch of different industries. And then you can see the company sort of faltered and, and sort of staled uh, or, or went sort of sideways from about you know, 1992 all the way forward to about 2000, 2001. And that was the, the dot-com uh, blow up there. You can see that our revenue sort of peaked in 99 and then dropped in 2000, 2001. We call that the portfolio realignment. We, we sold off 16 businesses for over $3 billion. And we bought 56 different companies. And so now we're more focused purely on electrical, 85% of the company, and 15% on tools and hardware. And you can see since 2001, 2002, what we call operational excellence. And I'll talk to you more about uh, that period of time. And that was my affiliation with the company. We've done uh, reasonably well as an industrial company. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how we try to introduce new technology, globalization, and, uh, and more exciting opportunities for an a industrial company. Here was the situation when I joined the company in 2001. I won't read through all of this, but obviously conditions were pretty tough. Everybody's equity was underwater. The growth of the company was zeroed to declining for the last five, six, seven, eight years. Uh, we were fully levered on the debt side, so our debt to total capital was about 43%. And uh, a company called Danaher tried to make an offer to buy the company. There was an asbestos issue around the company. So morale and the whole momentum around the company was pretty difficult. So the question is, uh, as you sit in that seat, you sort of think to yourself, geez, was this a good career decision to join this company? And I'll fast forward and walk you through what we've done and, and, and how we do it. Fundamentally, the company had a pretty good set of businesses. Uh, these are not all household names to you. But we have really key positions in Krauss Heinz, which is the oil and gas explosion proof, harsh and heavy duty electrical protection devices. If you go to Floor or Bechtel, they will know the company extremely well through those brands. Busman is fuses, overcurrent protection in electronics, electrical applications, and transportation applications. And then lighting, you may know, Halo is our brand in lighting. And you'll see some of it at Home Depot and Lowe's. And then Power Systems is the distribution grid and a whole series of other products. I mean, it's not that important that you understand all that. This is probably a little bit more relevant. We serve uh, four key end markets. 
the industrial, the commercial, residential, and the utility space. And so as you think about this asset base and trying to create shareholder value, that's a real asset, that we're not singly dependent on any end market for our growth or our long-term success. And right now, in this economy, obviously the residential market is way down, but the industrial space, the commercial space, and our utility space are doing quite well. So we'll talk to you a little bit more about uh, decentralization of our revenue. Um, these niche little businesses are really important in these niche little markets. So we do have a number one or number two space in each of these markets. So that's another important asset of the company. But the process from which you use to, to turn the company around, essentially, or the process that we used at Cooper, is pretty much focused in three areas, right? It's about people. And I'm going to repeat this, this theme about people over and over and over. It's about people. It's about processes and standardization. And then it's about culture and values within a company. So any situation that you find yourselves in over time, my theory of the case is these three things and, and building success through these three activities is what's going to be core uh, to long-term success. Um, essentially, my entire team has been new to the company since I joined the company six years ago. The only gentleman is our CFO who was there before I arrived. And so slowly over time, we went out to some very important industrial companies and hired a terrific uh, group of people to run our businesses. And again, the, the success of the company is not the CEO, it's the team, it's the processes, and it's the cultures and values of the organization. So these people deserve a lot of credit for the day-to-day -day operations. Eight of these people run the divisions that we control, of course, and then there's a group of corporate folks. Uh, Tom was just here with me this morning meeting with a lot of your professors on wireless technology and some of the advanced uh, areas that we're interested in working with the university. Um, we also set ourselves up, I mean, how do you manage 31,000 people and keep the priorities of the company and the initiatives of the company uh, coordinated? And this is a, a, a trick out of the old GE manual where Jack Welch was very good at setting up very clear and succinct visions or issues that we all need to focus on. And these are the five initiatives that we, we run the company on. Um, customer loyalty is about accelerating our grow core growth rates and our service to our customers. Innovation is about technology, adding technology to our products. Globalization, of course, is developing markets and pushing more of the company into emerging, faster-growing markets. Talent development is something that we talked about. We're trying to now fill open positions in the company at a 70% rate from internal candidates. And so we want to be a, a talent academy within the organization. And then operational excellence is what all industrial companies have to do to stay afloat. If you look at the steel industry, if you look at the airline industry, you look at the automotive industry, when you stop getting productivity, you, you cease to exist. And, uh, and, and so that's another core competence that we think about as we think about the company. This is something that we began to measure about five, six years ago. The company didn't even measure their vitality index. If you have an initiative, if you want to track something, you have to be able to measure it, of course. And so we think about percent of products introduced in the last three years. And it was 7%, and we're, we're certainly uh, double that today with the idea that we're going to take it to 20%. So new products, more engineering, more technology is core to what we do long term. Uh, some of our business, our electronics business, is at a 50 60% on a three-year vitality. But many of our businesses, the Crescent Wrench, for, for example, hasn't really been redesigned or, or reintroduced. There's some nuances to it, of course, but, uh, but pretty much has been the same product for many, many years. In fact, it's the 100-year anniversary this year of the Crescent Wrench. I talked quickly about the international. It's a great opportunity for us. The other challenge of a CEO is finding out where to invest. Where do you want to put your resources? And so international is a big part of it. I had a chance to live in Mexico City in my career. I had a chance to live in Asia. So very comfortable with the idea and how to set up an international organization. And we've taken our, our revenue from a billion two internationally to over two billion dollars. And the international part of our business in the last quarter grew at 30%. The domestic part grew at about 5%. So $2 billion growing at 30% is obviously very attractive to our core growth rates. And it's important to what we do. We won the emergency lighting project on the Olympic uh, swimming uh, uh, um, facility in, in Beijing. Uh, and a lot of key projects. That's the largest capacitor bank in the world. They bring electricity from Mongolia down to Beijing, and they use Cooper capacitors, which are, by the way, manufactured in China uh, for that project. So it's a great opportunity for us to showcase what we do. Our core growth strategy is pretty simple. Our businesses will grow at pretty much GDP. And then we do these initiatives, share gain, 
Uh, we talked about customer loyalty. We talked about innovation. We talked about globalization. So the idea is to take a 3% GDP rate, add 2 to it, you get a 5%, and then we acquire businesses that are about a 5 to 8% rate a year to augment that overall growth rate. And so the idea here is to get a maybe an 8, 9, 10% growth rate, and then we can generate very strong earnings off of that. And this has been our growth rate, our core growth rate for the last couple years. And it's, it's pretty good by industrial standards. I think most of you may be used to Silicon Valley type companies or Googles or Yahoos with substantially higher growth rates. And we'll talk about how to create value uh, and, and, and repetitive value in a minute. But this is pretty attractive for an industrial company. So this is what we do. Um, on the manufacturing side, I'm not going to drill into this, but of course we have 60-odd uh, factories in the United States. 58% of our headcount is from manufacturing outside the U.S. We also drive sourcing activities of steel, copper, subassemblies from low-cost countries. We have a technology center in Shanghai. We do a lot of manufacturing in places like Mexico. And then we drive a 3% cost of goods sold productivity calculation across our businesses. So you, you can't get away from the operating mechanics of the business. Uh, again, 31,000 people, but we've got a standard set of metrics across the entire company that we didn't have several years ago. And these are the margins on our products, and you can see having bottomed out in 2002, uh, that our margins on 85% of the company are over 17% today and going in the right direction. So margins, profitability, and the question is then what are you going to do with the free cash flow? And we'll talk to you about that in a second and where we want to invest it. We also use tools like Lean. Um, and we try to get more productive on our capital efficiency. And so the other thing we've done in the company is, is begun to be more efficient on how we use capital. We've taken it down from $175 million, and we run the company today between $100 and $110 million. And then our cash flow, which is very important. You, earnings are not what Wall Street looks at. They really look at cash flow. And our cash flow has been greater than our earnings for about seven years in a row. There aren't many industrial companies that are able to generate more cash than earnings. And that obviously means that we're getting more efficient on our balance sheet. And these are things that Wall Street uh, spends a lot of time calculating and thinking about. And then our balance sheet is in very good shape, as you can imagine. You generate that kind of strong cash flow. That our balance sheet could literally be debt free if we stopped uh, our acquisition activity. And uh, so we're in a terrific position to think about what we want to do with this cash and how we want to create value for our shareholders as we go forward. We also invest in technology. We have, in the last five years, put SAP over the entire company. It took us five years to do that. You think about how to enable a company to be more efficient, to get rid of waste, to be more profitable. And uh, installing Oracle or SAP, uh, an enterprise business system, over an entire company like this is very complicated. But it was something that we decided to spend $100 million in five years doing. And today, you can see at the end of 07, we're pretty much on the track that we laid out in 2003. And we're pretty much through that process today. So we expect to get it better inventory turns, better profitability by customer, better international sales reports. Very important that you stay on the leading edge of technology as you run these old companies. This is something that we created about two years ago. We were a holding company type of structure before, and we've moved to more of a central uh, command and control type structure. And we thought it was very important that our employees know what our cultures and values and our principles really are about how we want to run the company. So again, if you think about your, your own sort of uh, uh, personal performance in our organization, you ought to be able to go through the left and the right side of this and find out how much of this really resonates with you personally. Uh, you know, integrity is something that gets a lot of play uh, today. It's almost uh, embarrassing to be a CEO today with some of the behavior uh, that we see out there publicly. So uh, 31,000 employees, and you can imagine everybody has a spouse and a kid or two. There's 100,000 people plus who count on me to have integrity every day. And so uh, it's not something that you just wake up one day and you decide to start talking about integrity in an organization. You either have it or you don't. And there's nobody who really looks over my shoulder to make sure that I do the things that I'm supposed to do. But fundamentally, it's to the core of who you are as a leader. And I think this is something that, uh, that we need to see more of, people not putting their own personal interests ahead of the company and again, uh, when people ask me what I do, I, I generally just say I work for a company and we manufacture, and I really don't talk about me as an individual. You'll see my picture never on our internal material. Uh, I didn't want to put our, my picture in our annual report, and the investor relations person told me that it would be uh, unusual or viewed suspiciously if I didn't put it in there. So three years ago, I had a small picture put in, and I've used the same picture every year 
and I'm going to try to outlast them and leave that same picture in for as long as I'm with the company. But I think a lot of CEOs get wrapped up into their own personal success, and it's embarrassing. It's, it's very embarrassing. So, so that's something that we talk a lot about, uh, very firm on, on integrity types of issues. We talk about people and leadership, of course. We talk about accountability, big deal, big deal. Trying to get people to be personally accountable for their actions and their results. Speed and adaptability, of course, and then our ability to deliver results. And then on the right-hand side, it's about who we are, right? A passion for the customer. Innovation is our lifeblood, leveraging different technologies, whether it's RF technology, LED technology, whatever types of things that we're doing in one division, we can leverage across the whole company. Excelling at globalization and then a mindset for continuous improvement, no matter what aspect of the company we're talking about. And then pictorially, we talk to our employees this way, that we talk about the customer being in the center of our universe, surrounded with these great brands and businesses with these leadership positions. We're driving these five initiatives and we are all tied together by a common set of cultures and values. And that's what we've built over the company uh, over the last five, six years. Um, the challenge as a CEO is, is what do you want to go after or what, what metrics are you trying to maximize as an organization? And I think that uh, it, it's a balancing act, right? Uh, you could always maximize profitability or cash or growth at the, at the sacrifice of one or the other. I think the, the key issue is to go after all three simultaneously. I mean, Jack Welch used to say all the time, I can find managers who can manage in the short term, and I can find managers who manage for the long term. It's very difficult to find managers who can do both. And I think maximizing your margins at the same time you're going after growth and cash flow is really sort of the discipline approach that we try to drive uh, across our company. And you can see that while we've had about 9% growth on the revenue side over the last several years, we've been able to grow our earnings per share at 22%. And as I mentioned earlier, the quality of our earnings, which are measured by cash flow relative to the earnings, has been at least equal to or above our earnings. So if you looked at the old Enron model and you looked at the earnings, you were fooled into the profitability of the company. If you looked at the cash, you were never fooled in that model because it didn't generate any real cash. So we are very, very uh, much aligned with the quality of the earnings and how, how, uh, how real the earnings are. And it's not a series of accounting issues around depreciation or other th types of things that you can use on the accounting side to maximize the earnings. I thought I'd just throw in a slide we shared with our board this week. Um, you know, the economy, I don't know how many of you uh, follow the, 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 the stock market on a daily or hourly basis, but uh, it's certainly bouncing around. There's some real positives out there. The industrial economy around energy is strong. Uh, the commercial aircraft, the private aircraft, and the military aircraft industries are strong. The energy markets, of course, are very strong. The commodity markets, the metals markets, data centers. A lot of real positives out there. There's a lot of questions about commercial construction with the tightening credit in a more difficult uh, uh, financial environment. Certainly the consumer is, is running out of gas. I saw the retail numbers yesterday were, were difficult. Automotive numbers, the furniture, appliances are all very, very uh, tough industries right now. And uh, the housing market will continue to go down for, for a while. Uh, you certainly saw, you know, it's amazing how dumb uh, the average uh, American can really be, right? You saw the dot-com error, and then you thought we kind of learned something from the errors of robust and accelerated bubbles, and you went right back to the housing error, and uh, if you couldn't see the analogy or the similarities between those two situations, it's mind-boggling. But yet we find people out there buying four, five, six, seven houses in Vegas speculating that they'll be able to sell them for more at the peak of that market, and uh, as you'd expect, the whole thing comes unglued. So, you know, it's a, it's a funny uh, perspective that it's, it, what drives the stock market, someone said many years ago, is it's, it's greed and it's fear. And right now you went from greed about May, June, July, and you've come to a fear uh, perspective right now where everybody's running for cover and it doesn't seem to be a, a bottom in sight for a little while. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, dissecting our businesses, thinking about where we want to grow. They're not homogeneous businesses. There's a lot of interesting little niche product lines to these businesses, and this is what we spend our time doing. How do you find interesting markets? And this is what we sort of come across as far as you know, four key long-term global trends around the world, energy demand, conservation reliability on the energy side, global infrastructure, mass notification, and safety. These are four key themes that resonate in the company. And here's where we take our capital and redeploy it on really interesting, high-growth, less cyclical markets. 
So uh, harsh and heavy-duty heavy specialty connectors for military applications, for subsea, underwater applications, for offshore platforms, very high margin, very interesting uh, custom-engineered uh, technology. Uh, we have taken our power systems business, which used to be a component business. We've gotten into demand management. We've gotten into energy efficiency. We've gotten into uh, high ends of reliability, so software over substation automation, trying to automate the distribution grids. First time in our history where we bought a software company. On lighting, we've gotten to controls, occupancy sensors, LED technology. So again, all advanced uh, products around energy efficiency uh, as we go forward. And then in the uh, European business around mass notification. So you think about what happened in West Virginia. We have products that you could literally put two or three uh, large outdoor speakers on buildings on a campus like this and communicate to the general masses in, this, in, a, in the event of an emergency of a fire or on-campus event and direct people to go inside or to exit the campus in one special direction or another. There's military applications. There's uh, refinery and platforms where people have a hard time communicating with people and spread over large, vast areas. It's sort of a military technology that we've been commercializing. And it's all wireless, of course, so you don't need to lay any infrastructure or hardware. Acquisitions are a whole uh, theory in and of themselves, right? The, the theory is that 70% of them don't work, so why would you do them? And uh, it's because we think we're in the 30% that can make them work. Um, but you, you have to be very focused and disciplined. Uh, we buy to strengthen the core. Uh, we buy high specification, high technology businesses. They enhance our global footprint. Uh, we try to buy businesses that have good working capital characteristics. And we target businesses that have good management teams to, to join our team. And uh, we, we look at uh, over nearly 1,000 properties in 50 different countries. We made uh, offers of due diligence on close to 38 deals, over $5 billion in revenue. And we closed on only 14. So you cast a very, very wide net. And uh, you're very focused on what it is that you buy. And you have to stay very disciplined in the process. And we're seeing today in this environment, because private equity is pulling back, we're seeing more and more opportunities to expand the footprint, to add new technologies, and of course, to take us into new uh, expanding markets. We've made several acquisitions in China. We're chasing a couple others. We've got a couple of large European deals. We've got 20 different letters of intent written right now. So we're hopeful in the next three to six months, we can close maybe half of those deals as well. A lot of work on due diligence and financials and such. And, and if you look at those markets that I just showed you, you know, we've got about 400 to $500 million of revenue in these new spaces, and yet there are $12 billion of market opportunity for out there, so it's growing at two to four times the core growth rate of the company. So again, you extract cash from the old wrenches and hammers and the old sluggers, and you migrate that cash into more attractive, global, less cyclical markets, and that's our, that's our business model. So we want to invest in new technologies, wireless communications, LED technology, and, uh, and we think that's quite attractive. So if you look at our business model just at the fundamentally, and this is a slide that I used with analysts less than a week ago, you have a stable, predictable uh, business model of 5% core growth with 5% acquired growth. And we think we can generate earnings per share growth of 10 to 15% over the long haul. And again, I kept talking to you about the cash being greater than net. We think that we have great end market exposure with those four different end markets. We have great channel exposure. I didn't talk to you about that, but we serve all the different channels. And we have great international upside. On top of that, we've got strong cash flow with an improving working capital metric. So we continue to improve our efficiency as a company to generate cash flow. We're investing in faster growing, less cyclical, higher margin businesses. And we think we've got a great team of people working with us and that we can continue to improve and train uh, the organization's capability. And then again, over the last four years, we've invested in the SAP enterprise. We've built out our international infrastructure. We've hired country managers, locals, so Korea, Vietnam, China, uh, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, uh, Mexico, South America. We've put it in infrastructure to leverage our capabilities internationally. We've got this low-cost country uh, sourcing activity, our productivity programs, which drive continued uh, efficiencies on the manufacturing side. And again, we've got this great balance sheet that gives us great financial flexibility uh, as we go forward. You know, part of my job is I don't own the company, of course, but part of my job is to maximize the uh, value creation for our shareholders. There's theories of, of what do you do to do that. 
Uh, there's a whole bunch of different theories of the case of what investors look for. If you chase the different flavor of the week, you'll chase your tail forever. Um, what we found is that uh, great companies achieve long-term steady growth over all cycles. So even when there's a recession, you know, do you buy companies? Are you investing in international? Do you have new products on deck? Can you grow through the cycle? Return on invested capital, margins, and free cash flow do matter. So again, I keep coming back to this theory of cash is king. And strong performance and process-driven organizations generally do better than others in the long-term value creation model. And so our stock from 98 to about 2002, 2003 was pretty much flat with a market cap, which is your share price times the number of shares outstanding, at about $3.5 billion. And today our company is trading for a little bit over $9 billion of market value. So that's a triple of value from 2002 to 2007. So that's been a lot of fun to be part of a team that can create that kind of shareholder value. Now the future certainly is ahead of us. One of the funnest things I've had to do, and again, I generally hate this stuff, but I had a chance to ring the bell at the New York Stock Exchange. It's kind of corny, but it was a lot of fun. And it was the, <laughs> it was the day that the Dow actually crossed the 13,000 for the first time, and our stock crossed 50, which is equivalent to 100 because we split it. And we brought the group of the guys, and we had a, we had a blast. So it was, uh, again, corny thing to do, but it was kind of fun. Um, so that only took about 25 minutes, Randy, and I told you I'd get through. But I wanted to give you a perspective of, of what I do, and I thought that would be helpful and, and, and really don't like talking too much about uh, myself. I, I'm no different than any of you. Uh, I was here 25 years ago. I had a backpack on my pack. I wore jeans, and uh, I certainly wasn't the brightest of my class, and I probably wasn't the, uh, uh, the most uh, academically astute. Um, I graduated in 82. Uh, I had a vision for what I wanted to do with my career. I wanted to be an engineer when I left. I went to Hughes Aircraft down in San Diego. I worked on night vision systems, and I worked on uh, uh, flexible automatic circuit testing equipment. It's a great story. There are mostly electrical engineers at this division, and we used to install these systems for testing uh, circuit boards and such. And there was a company uh, back in, I think it was Virginia or something like that. It was the old uh, GTE who was a great customer, and they used to run these things 24 hours a day, these machines, seven days a week, and all of our service people were out on field trips, and so they wanted me to go, and I was paranoid about going because I knew nothing about how to fix these systems. They had a remote diagnostics, and you had to be able to interface the software and find out where the problem was and fix it. Now, we had a system in the factory that was a demo system for us to train on and such, so I grabbed this giant suitcase out of my house, and I took every circuit board out of this dummy system on the shop floor. I went to see the customer, and all my buddies were all engineers and thought I would die out there because this is one of the most difficult customers to, to work with. And I told the, uh, of course, they were all their engineers were there with me wanting to watch me fix this machine. And I said, no, 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 you guys, it was like 9 o'clock at night. They take you right to the factory, and you're expected to work 24 hours until you fix it. You don't go to a hotel. So I told them, no, no, you're all making me nervous. Just leave the room. Then I just took the boards and just started swapping boards. And I finally found the board that fixed the system because there was a defect on one of the boards. I never would have found it through the remote diagnostics. But I was able to fix it. The customer wrote this glowing letter of, of, uh, of, of uh, great service. And they always wanted me back for the foreseeable future. And I thought, oh my god, what am I going to do? So to this day, those guys still, uh, still tease me over that, uh, that great fix I had. Um, I decided to go back to business school. You know, I liked the technical background, but I thought that the business school would give me uh, more flexibility in my career. And, and it, obviously, it was well served. Uh, my vision at that point was to come back and be a vice president of technology for Hewlett Packard. I was working in San Diego. And so I really wanted to come back to uh, technology and such. And, um, and then when I got to business school, I took a summer job at Bain, which changed you know, my whole career because I didn't know what investment banking was. I didn't know what consulting was. I didn't know what marketing was. I was teasing the dean that when I was here, we were on the quarter system, and that, uh, that uh, I think we had 185 required units out of 190 units to graduate. So, so there weren't a whole lot of choices that we had way back then of, uh, of where to spend our free time. So I knew nothing. And, uh, and business school was a lot of fun. I took a summer job at Bain. And of course, they, they, they wanted uh, me to come back on a full-time basis. I did. And uh, met a whole different uh, group of people and had a lot of fun. I ended up meeting my wife in Boston. She worked for Fidelity. She had gone to Harvard Business School. And, uh, and then I left Bain with one of the partners who became the CEO of this company called Oak Industries. So again, it wasn't like I was leaving to a disparate business. It was through a connection of a person that I knew. 
And uh, I thought he was brilliant. In fact, when I left, uh, I actually worked for him for free for a year in his basement because he was starting up his own consulting company. He was going to work on private equity. And uh, he still teases me to this day that I was a complete idiot for working for him for free. When he took the job as the CEO of Oak, which was a publicly traded company, at a dollar a share, near broke, he told me that he would give me a bunch of his equity, some of his stock options, to, to compensate me for the, the time I had worked for him for free. And so there's a theory here of, of doing what you, what you want to do. It's not about, of course, money or, or compensation. And then Oak ended up going from $1 to $5 in about four years. And I knew that. I mean, Bill was very smart. He had worked for Cummins Engine. He was a submarine captain in the military. He was just a great guy. And then I realized that Oak wasn't really large enough. The whole company was only about $350 million. They made crystal oscillators. They made uh, switches and some interesting businesses. And I had friends at General Electric from business school, and I ended up interviewing up there. And I took a job in corporate business development, which is the headquarters in Fairfield. I had a chance to meet Jack Welch and work with him and a number of other senior executives. I worked for Jim McNerney, who now runs Boeing, and a number of other senior-level people. I knew Bob Nardelli, reluctantly, I have to admit to that. But, uh, but it was a great experience because I had a chance to live in Mexico. I had a chance to live in Asia. And I really became a general manager through their training program, I would say. And then I uh, came to Cooper Industries in 2001. Um, I was looking for an opportunity that, A, had some uh, equity upside, so where the stock was probably not valued the way it ought to be. And two, they had a CEO who was 62 years old or 61 years old who was near retirement. And he had to retire at 65. And I figured if I went in and did a reasonable job, I would be able to... Uh, to maybe work my way up in the organization. So took a lot of risks, and I worked for really good people, really smart people, uh, good coaches over my years. And of course, you know, my success is certainly a large part because of them. In each of these uh, situations, you talk about winning teams. You know, the, the stock or the appreciation of the, of the equity is sort of an output. It's certainly not what you focus on. You work for great companies with great products. You work for great teams, and then great results just happen. So uh, again, we're not, uh, in, in any of these jobs, not overly asphyxiated on, on the equity appreciation, but they've all been great uh, opportunities for me personally. Um, you know, I just thought I'd put together a slide on sort of what the, the role is. And you know, I talked about teams and people quite a bit, and I can't overemphasize the importance of that. Um, again, we talked about uh, ethics in this environment. Um, there's not a lot of it out there, and uh, it needs to be emphasized, I think, across uh, our industry, and uh, certainly from the top down. The vision and the strategy, I spend a lot of time with our shareholders, our board of directors, talking about the direction we're taking the company. Resource allocation, people, money, and then uh, face to the customers. I spend a lot of time with our customers and, of course, our owners. I see our top 10 shareholders at least once a year. Fidelity Investments, an old uh, business school friend of mine, runs the Contra Fund, and he owns 11% of the company. So when I was thinking about different jobs in GE, I used to call Will Danoff, is his name, and I used to ask him about different companies, and I called him up and I asked him about Cooper, and he said, oh, no, we don't own any. And normally he'd take a day to get back to me because he'd have to check their database and check all the different funds. So I said, Will, I said, you know, don't you want to take some time and check the database? He said, no, 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 no. He said, I know this company. They're horrible. Uh, we don't own a share across all of Fidelity. And I thought, well, that's where I want to go work, right? That's, that was, so I joined the company and said, oh, my God, you're a complete idiot. How could you do such a thing? And then over time, we'd go up and see him, go up and see him. And, and today, he's our largest single shareholder, owns 11% of the company. And he's been an owner for uh, probably close to four or five years. And so he's done very, very well uh, as an owner. And I go see him probably twice a year. So um, you know, our customers, of course, I know Many of our customers personally uh, try to get out to our employees twice a year. Uh, we go out and see factories. I go out and see our hourly people. I walk the factories. So on an every three to four year basis, I generally get to every one of our plants every three to four years. Um, I travel, of course, overseas quite a bit. I have two of my staff meetings, the old CEO of the company. I worked for him for five years. He never left the country. So I take my staff. We go to Europe. And then we go to Asia at least once a year. Then I go once a year without him. So I'm at least overseas for four weeks a year at a minimum. And if we're working on deals or something unusual, of course, uh, there's more travel than that. And then what I wanted to do just at the end uh, is just put together a couple, uh, couple comments on, on sort of lessons learned in leadership. Uh, you know, the higher up you move in an organization, it's more and more important that your actions speak to, uh, to your style and your culture and who you are. 
Um, you know, it, it, in the early days, you do a lot of goofy things, and, and people don't really take notice. But when you're on the top, everything matters. I mean, what time you come to work, what type of PDA you carry, uh, how you dress, who answers your phone, what kind of pictures you have in your office, everything. And it is fair. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a different uh, style or, or lifestyle. Uh, I always worry about my kids and my family being exposed. Of course, all my compensation is public, which is different. Uh, the Houston Chronicle publishes a list of what the executives make, and they blast your picture right on the front page of the newspaper. And at the same time, you're trying to take your kids to school and being somewhat private. I don't see the publisher of the newspaper printing his salary on the front page of the newspaper, which is interesting. But, but they seem to feel that it's perfectly OK to print everybody else's, which is, which is fascinating. But anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> it's important that you know this. And someone told me this, one of the vice chairmen uh, taught this at GE, and I thought it was a very uh, interesting piece. Again, this, this theme of people I cannot overemphasize. And, and I think as you go through your careers, a lot of people get notoriety by being mean-spirited or by doing ruthless types of things. I, I just don't buy it. I, I think that who you hire and how you hire over your career will define how successful you are. And so it's very important that you have a series of criteria on which you're going to hire. And there's a left-hand list that I've always sort of tried to use as, as sort of a checklist of who it is that you want to try to attract to the company. The right-hand list is maybe a little easier to remember, the three C's. It, it sort of goes to the same thing, competence, experience, smartness, uh, mental toughness. Commitment is big, of course. Uh, how committed are they? And character, which goes back to the integrity and some of the other things that we talked about earlier. Um, this idea of humility and being uh, somewhat empathetic is a big deal. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge to find people who are talented and smart, aggressive, but not egotistical. And I think that's sort of that balancing act that you have to work through. Very smart people generally are very destructive people in an organization. So there's a balancing act. Uh, we never fire anyone generally because they're not smart enough. Um, it's always for a whole series of other issues. And then, um, Lastly, I'll just comment on maybe 10 different topics. But it, it's, it's all about loving what you do. I mean, if you listen to anybody, I think, in any industry, a, a ballerina, a musician, I think people just sort of find what naturally fits to them, whether it's a big company, small company. And always having a positive attitude, I think, is, is critical. Um, this concept of always over-delivering in every job you're ever in. I mean, I think people, uh, especially young people, get wrapped up into what's the next opportunity and how do I get promoted and worrying about their careers. And I think it's very, very important to be committed to being the best in the job that you're in. When I was an engineer, I wanted to be a good engineer. When I took all these different level jobs, I wanted to do the best. And I always thought about it from the perspective of, of my boss and what he or she would be interested in, in in seeing me to help further their careers. So I put myself in, in their perspective and said, well, what would they want out of me? They want someone positive. They want someone who does the extra mile and delivers and delivers and delivers and never complains. So if you can do that, I think that's, that's the best thing you can focus on. And again, I, I think I've hit this pretty good. Um, treat people with dignity. It is a long, long road. And I would say at Cooper Industries, there's over 50 people who used to work for me at that company. And how do you attract 50 people if you didn't treat those people right early in their careers? So the company is not about me. It's about their careers and me making sure that they're appreciated, they're compensated, they're building their careers, and they're happy in delivering in our organization. Go back to item number two, I am demanding, but at the same time, I try to be rewarding and very considerate and respectful. Even when I'm chewing somebody out for a lousy budget or a lousy quarter, I never call them names, generally don't swear at them, and, uh, and I try to make it a constructive dialogue about what they didn't do well and try to make it a learning experience. Again, honesty, integrity, personal responsibility, take accountability. Uh, very open with our board. We talk openly and honestly about the wins and then the losses. Very open about our mistakes. And they, they sort of beat me up sometimes because they think I'm too uh, revealing on some of that. But it's very important that you establish yourself as an open and clear communicator. Even with Wall Street, we always point out our negatives and what didn't go as well. Embrace change. See it as an opportunity. You'll all be in situations where you change your boss. You get a new CEO. There's a different direction. I think it's very important to be adaptable and step into that. And again, of course, a sense of humor. Take yourself, never take yourself too seriously, seriously humble, and admit uh, when you're wrong, which is, uh, I try to do that every once in a while. Um, 
we always look for opportunities to learn. Uh, I have had a, a, a great opportunity to work for really good people, and all of them were great teachers. So I still keep in touch with a lot of these people. Um, I told you about this gentleman who ran Oak Industries. I've always tried to figure out what I thought personally of the individual who was leading the organization, and could I learn in that opportunity, in that situation. And I think you learn a lot more from good, successful people than you do necessarily from organizations where you have people who are more considerate about their own personalities, their own success than, than the organization in, in teaching. Um, I've never taken a job for the money. Um, I graduated here, I was making $25,000, $26,000 a year. Uh, I've taken a lot of jobs to work for free. Uh, I wanted to work in a stock brokerage one summer. I went home and worked for free. I worked for this other gentleman for free. I think if you think more about the experience and you focus more on the career and the jobs and the experience that you want to get, the money comes. I mean, I don't get paid today for what I do today. I get paid for 25 years of other experiences where I probably didn't get paid uh, at market rates or, or who knows. But, uh, but as it turned out, it's never been an issue for me. And uh, it was ne I never took a job because it was more money. I hear people telling me, well, I think I'm going to go here because it's more money. And I think to myself, I mean, you're crazy? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, and then the last two, people always ask me, it, it's not about luck. I, I think it has nothing to do with In fact, I've been very unlucky. I went down to Mexico just when the Mexico peso crisis happened in 95, 96. And I went out to Asia in 97 and ran the lighting business for, it was a $700 million business, right in the face of the Asian crisis in 1997. And, and so uh, I've been lucky in a sense that I've worked for really good people and I've had great opportunities. But it's not about luck. It's, it's about taking advantage of great opportunities. And I think all of us are presented with great opportunities in our careers. The question is what people take them and what people are too scared or, or don't want to make the right sacrifice to take the opportunity because it's in a city or a state or a country where you're not necessarily willing to go, to go locate. And then that sort of ties into this last one, right? It's all about sacrifice. Uh, when I got the CEO job of Cooper Industries, my old boss at Oak Industries called me up and said, I got to give you credit. He said, you worked your ass off to get the job. Uh, there wasn't a job that I would never not take because of location or because of what it was. So I always uh, really went the extra mile to figure out what the opportunity was and what the learning experience would be. And then, uh, and then I made five moves in GE in eight years. And uh, that was always very difficult, especially on your spouse, because new territories, you know, brand new babies, living in Asia, certainly not easy, but was all part of the, the fabric of learning. And so uh, it was all a good experience. And with that, I think I'm pretty much on track. But we'd love to... Questions? Please use the microphone. Thank you for coming. I really enjoyed the talk and view from the top. I have two questions. One of them is, did I, did I misread? I didn't see it on your slide that you guys acquired Tektronix recently. Which one? Tektronix. Dan, Dan no, Aher. that was Danaher. Da that's a different Danaher that you guys have? That, no, that's not us. Danaher tried to acquire Cooper in 2001 as well. I see. So when we were sort of down at the bottom, uh, Danaher tried to acquire Cooper. But no, that's Danaher acquired Tektronix. Yes. Thanks. So the second question was uh, regarding the, the view from the top, which I really appreciated. But the, in terms of the standardization. You talked about standardizing the company, providing standards. Is that from the inside corporate culture or for the, as the way the customer sees it from the outside? It should be both. I mean, we try to start cross-selling. From a customer's perspective, they used to buy from individual businesses with individual rebate programs, right, with right. individual salespeople. And what we've done is homogenize the sales teams. We still have individual salespeople from businesses, but we've integrated the, the commercial package, the rebate, the terms and conditions, and all those types of things. But I, I think to answer your question fairly, more internally, what's the culture of the company? You know, you talk about operating systems. What do you do? Every January, we go down and we have a management meeting in Miami with the top 150 people. Then we start our strategy sessions. Then we do our people reviews. Then I have a CEC in Europe. So you almost kind of march through the calendar every, and so people now that get very accustomed to how we run the company. If you looked at my calendar, year over year over year, my calendar is just about the same calendar. And that's that operating system that you need to get into the company. GE was masterful. Uh, Emerson is very, very good. Danaher has Danaher Business Systems, which is very good. So a number of companies have done a very good job at this. It just didn't exist in Cooper. And so that's what we've been building out. Yeah. So, 
Um, you mentioned uh, a lot about people, uh, and you mentioned that you, you had uh, people that you knew who work for you right now. How do you, or what have you found is the most effective way of finding and attracting good people? Well, it's always easier to find people that you've worked with before and you bring them along with you because you know them and there's no risk associated with it. The second thing is you figure out what your culture is in your company and you try to find companies that have a similar type of a culture. So our, our, our company is a matrix organization. When you go internationally to China, all of our people are in the same tech center, but our divisions still run their individual businesses. So Emerson is a similar culture, that it's a matrix organization. GE is, of course, a similar. Honeywell is a similar culture. So you, you look to places that have a similar type of a culture. Um, the other thing is you, when you interview people, of course, you look for you know, certain levels of competence and, and where they have demonstrated and actually done something of great substance. And that's one of the things that's always hard to get at with people. They have all these great things on their resume, but when you ask them, what did you do? I took inventory turns from five to eight. Okay, what did you do? How did you do it? Tell me, did you do something on scheduling? Did you do something on lean? Did you do something with your suppliers? I mean, what did you physically do that was different? And so many people get tripped up because they just put it there, and they were part of a team, but they don't really fundamentally understand what they did uh, to achieve the results. And you get experience at this. You just, you just get experience at it over time. So, uh, but I think hiring people you know, of course, is, is sort of the best way to go. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a consummate recruiter, right? I mean, I'm always out recruiting. No matter where I am, I'm always recruiting. We have people, uh, who, we have people out of undergraduate who, who, who enlist in our OLP program. It's an entry-level program. And I tell the HR people, if there's someone you want to get who, who's, who's thinking about it, let me call them. Because there's nothing more powerful than the CEO of the company calling somebody at home who's a graduate of college thinking, and then the question always is, well, how many other CEOs called you at home to recruit you to the company? It's, you know, it takes me 15 minutes. You know, I tell our HR people, it's easy, I can do that. So, so uh, we just hired a new uh, sourcing lead for our whole company, and I called him at home, and he, you know, he's taken back by the fact that I would take the time. Anybody who joins a company at the corporate level, anybody that we hire into any of the divisions at the top level, they have to come to Houston, I want to meet them. So I spend 30% to 40% of my time on people issues. So you know, that's a challenge, because most engineers, by definition, may not be the, the best people persons, right? I mean, you've got to kind of work on your, your people skills, not your, not your analytical skills sometimes, if, if you want to do this type of a job. I mean, that's, that's sort of the question. You had uh, many good suggestions for us. But the first item on your resume is UC Berkeley. So did you learn anything useful here? Oh. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I told the dean when he, when he came to see me, I, I had started at UC Davis. And I think um, coming to Berkeley was probably one of the most meaningful, there's three or four meaningful events that changed my life, right? And coming to Berkeley was one of them. When I came on this campus, and the, the size, the magnitude, I do best in open playing fields when there's no rules, when it's an undefined structure, when nobody's quite sure who's on first, that's where I flourish. And to come here and to be surrounded by uh, highly intellectual people, to be given so much personal freedom, to be uh, inundated with such a diverse community, the students, the faculty, the, 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 the town, the city, I mean, it, it never felt better in my whole career. I mean, I was, I was just perfectly comfortable here when I was here at this, as a student. Um, the whole social interaction, and I think that learning prepares you later for life in being able to figure out different complex issues. Um, the fact that you can solve differential equations or, or to do all the very tedious learning, I think it helps you have a process and not be afraid of complex issues. And I think it, there's, a, there's a process of learning or analyzing I'm still an engineer today, and I like work. when I go on vacation, I'm always building things and working with my hands. I love products, I love technology, uh, I love buying companies who have great technology. So at the core of me is still products and, and, and technology and those types of things. But I, I don't know how you have better preparation for what I do than a, a, a graduate degree or a, a degree from UC Berkeley. I just don't know. I just don't know you can be better prepared. i got to tell you, this was the dean of engineering till 1980. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I recognize your picture and all the. <laughs>
<laughs> but it's, 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 it's wonderful. And, it's, it's, and I was overseas for a long period of time and kind of lost contact with the universe. But it's, it's great being back. And uh, sure, you've got uh, you guys, uh, all of you that are here, have an opportunity of a lifetime to do what you want. Yeah. Not necessarily to be a CEO of a public company, but you could choose to be a chief technology officer, start your own company, whatever it is. Whatever it is. You, there's no excuse, certainly from an education perspective that you have. You can't fall back on that for sure. Great. Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, l let me do one thing. You know, I didn't notice that people are trying to leave. Oh, that's fine. But, uh, you know, Kirk has a gift, uh, a door prize for, and I'd like, uh, the, what's the plan? The plan of action is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly high tech, but, <laughs> but a transformer a, most of you couldn't use. Uh, by the way, the, 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 the way this is done is this luck of the draw. If you reach under your seat, behind, on the back of the seat, one of you, one of you lucky people should have a piece of paper attached to it. There you ah, go. Ah, that's you. Very good. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's, no, no, let, no, that's okay. Uh oh. That's okay. <laughs> Randy's, the Randy's good. We, we have a little gift, but we're going to hold out till we have any more. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you, you talked a lot about, um, you know, the value of having people in line with the overall vision of the company. And you touched on, you know, one of the things that you do is through your hiring practices, make sure that, that, that people understand, you know, the values of the company. Uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis, the people that are working um, around the world for the company, the people that are working on hourly uh, wages, I think it's very important that they understand um, you know, the values of the company too. Right. Can you talk a little bit about how, um, how you ensure that, that people that are you know, the, the basis of the company, I think, yeah. are in line with the vision? You know, and, and that's the uh, difficulty, right? Anytime you have 31,000 employees all over the world, trying to make sure that they understand that. So there's a couple of things that you do. I mean, anytime you put out any communication, you make sure you continually to reemphasize ethics and your, your points on our newsletter, on our website, uh, and all those types of things. The second is, anytime you deal with an issue, deal with it publicly and in the open and be firm and swift. So anytime we have issues, because what happens is that permeates the organization very, very quickly. So we'll have theft in Mexico, or we'll have some accounting issue in St. Louis. Whatever it is, we, we, we have a team of people who descend on the issue, and we act very swiftly and very, very quickly uh, to root out the problems and make sure it's perfectly clear why we did what we did. And we do that publicly, and we do that on purpose to make sure that everybody else in the organization knows there is no gray area. I keep hearing these terms. It's a gray. There is no gray area. Either they knew and they did something wrong, or they didn't. If they did, they're out. That's all there is to it. I don't care who it is. And I don't care what their excuses are. Um, and then when you go out to these places, you personally, you try to go out and touch as many people as you can. So when I go to China, I do skip level interviews with a, a town lunches and, and factory tours. And even though if it's a, a different language, we have a translator there. And I don't have the senior person running the business there. It's, it's generally without them. So the people feel a little bit more at ease maybe talking about issues uh, without the individual there. And Correct. Do you have a mechanism to encourage them to get involved with progress in the company? Yeah, I think, you know, if people think about, you know, mature businesses and can you bring in technology and stuff. I think one of the things that we've done just a great job at is taking sort of these mundane kind of tired products and making them uh, very advanced. And even fuses, we put a wireless mesh network kind of communication device on an electrical fuse and it can communicate to uh, an operator, a maintenance person, about what fuse went out, where it went out in the factory. And some of these factories are a million square feet, right? But those ideas do percolate up from the engineering organizations and from the plant managers and from people in the organization. The, the whole lean initiative is really about empowering the people who make the product every day and getting their input for how we ought to relay out the lines and getting their input in all this. And, and that's where, when you do a lean project, you really do it on the shop floor and you work with the hourly people who've been doing the processes for many, many years and try to in incorporate them in the process. So it's really a, uh, a very uh, uplifting uh, uh, opportunity for people who've been in the factories for many years. Yeah. Good questions. OK. So yeah, it's OK. We have a little gift for you. 
Great. I and love the color. actually like you to open it. Great. <laughs> Oh, my son. Oh. Well, we're going to the game, of course, and my son will love this. Thank you very, very much. We were, we were actually number one. Thank you very much. Now, living in Houston, of course, LSU is a, a school right 50, 60, well, it's a little, maybe 150 miles away. So we were actually number one for about six hours that one afternoon. I was horrified to, oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll see you at the game. Thank you. Ah, oh, this is great. We'll go down to the park and play. Thank